Hey, bananas, you think you grew me and you grew me? Hey, bananas, we want you to grow me. Want you to grow me. Driving June buggies everywhere. Just going crazy without a kid. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's Plastic EP coming to you live from <laughs> Melbourne, Australia. And I got master musician, songwriter, multi. What do you call it? Every instrument he plays. <laughs> this is the man, John Iden, and he's coming to you direct from the middle of Germany. How are you, John? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine, Plastic EP. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to be here, you know. What can I say? You know, it must be great. What is it now? Is it, It's sunny in Germany, is it? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's about 1 o'clock, approaching 1 o'clock here in the afternoon. It's nice and warm today. We had a really cold night, though. I mean, it was down to you know, nine degrees, you know, centigrade last night. So it was chilly. I've got relatives in Stuttgart, and I've got to tell you, the lifestyle down there, if you go down to your local pastry shop and mm -hmm. get cakes and pastries, it's the life, <laughs> isn't it? Tell the truth. Oh, yeah, they love their cake, you know. It's like cake and coffee in the afternoon. It's kind of like uh, tea and scones for the British. Yeah. And I've got to tell you something, John. When you come to Melbourne, Australia, we're going to hook up. And I'm going to take you from Melbourne one hour away to all the wineries. It's called the Yarra Valley. It's all oh, yeah, yeah. great I've and that. that. It's beautiful. You'll love it. Anyway, know, getting I've, on to I've... your fantastic rock style life, being part <laughs> of the Yardbirds, being in the Yardbirds, being in the McCarty band, being in your own band, being a master musician. You tell me the kind of lifestyle that you're lucky enough to lead. Well, it's uh, at times when it's all rolling, you know, when everything is kind of like groovy, you know, it is like being in a bit of a, it, it's like a movie. For for example, when we toured, we toured Australia in 99 and I'd never been on so many airplanes in my life, but in order to, to tour a country, because, you know, you, you well know, you know, so to go from Perth to Adelaide and then you know, then up to Darwin, you know, you can't do that in a day <laughs> in, in any other thing except for an airplane. So it's kind of like being in a movie where the movie reel's changing and you don't know what's going to come. There's no script. There's absolutely no script. Can and I stop you there? That sounds exactly like the monkey's movie head. Exactly. Yeah, it, there's no plot. There's no nothing. And it's yeah. all different things. There you yeah. just described it. Thank yeah. you. It, 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 it's, it's can be it can be really, really wonderful. Um, most of the times, it is if you have a if you have a positive approach to what's going on. You know, um, everyone's always you know accommodating. You're trying to get your thing together. You know, the music's good. You know, so um, as long as the general vibe is good, you can pretty well expect. I mean, I've been on so many tours. You know. Um, Sometimes it goes a little bit weird. Particular travel is always the is the main issue with with touring because that's what you're doing. You're traveling besides playing. And we did a tour of Sweden, and we counted. We had eleven different drivers. Now, when you're traveling in a country in the middle of the winter, and you've got eleven different people taking you around from one thing to another. There's no element of, you know, you don't get to know anything, you know, about like what you might expect. And it was hellacious. We, you know, black ice. You know, the van actually got totaled. You know, <laughs> I don't know. It's you know. That sounds like one of those other bands, you know, the fake one. I'm thinking of that movie. I can't think of those metal rockers. The one oh, that's it's Spinal Tap. Oh, it's very Spinal that's one. Tap. <laughs> Is it like that? It's very, very Spinal Tap. There's no question about it. We just watched it for the umpteenth time about two weeks ago, and I was like, oh, gosh, yeah, I know all this. <laughs> Have you got any weird fan stories like – when you go everywhere, the people come up and recognize you and go, I'm a Yardbirds fan, you know, I need your autograph or I need diesel. Well, yeah, that happens, you know. That, um, you know, we get people that come and are regulars, you know, to the show, to the shows. And um, if we hit back into a town, you know, you get somebody who, um, you know, it's always weird being in like a reformed band, you know, because the original band had such a, legacy 
And that is where the nostalgia is. That is where the, the memories are. So, but of course I've been in the group for 20, you know, associated with the group for like 25 years, you know, so um, there's an element of that now as well, where, you know, there are people who go, oh, well, you're my, you're, you're my connection to the, to the group, you know, and that, that's really nice. You know, it's sweet. Who was your biggest influence growing up? So good. Say something. Oh, recently I now, just say, I was too young for the Beatles. I caught on with the monkeys, but in your generation, who was it? Oh, well, it was definitely the Beatles, even though I was, I was five and 69, right? So I was going to kindergarten and before then my um, I'm very fortunate to have great recollections of my childhood. And most of those recollections actually come from music, um, hearing a song on the radio and realizing um, that I'm actually recalling things that were happening in 1960, late 65, 66, as they in, in my memory, hearing, say, the Turtles or something on the radio or Sonny and Cher, anything that was big. And I'll, I'll take me right back to that of being a, basically an infant. So music was had this catalyst for me. And I can remember around 69 when Abbey Road came out. Something was on the radio, Here Comes the Sun, The Long and Winding Road then came out just immediately after, after they released the Let It Be album. And I got these albums. My brother's a couple of years older and we had these albums brand new. And I remember asking my mother, so when can we go and see the Beatles, Mom? And she said, they just broke up. And I was like heartbroken, totally heartbroken. Um, so these songs were on the radio. And of course, by that time, the Beatles had advanced themselves musically to the degree that we know, you know. And I started getting all the old albums. So I was hearing Meet the Beatles and Beatles second album, all those capital releases in America. Um, and my brother delved deeper and found bootleg records that were available at the time. So we started having this massive like avalanche of Beatles music. And because it was so, it, the Beatles are so vast in their musical, uh, their musical journey, um, you started to hear things that were even influenced by music hall, you know, 1920s music in inside the, the Beatles own music. So your listening experience just became, well, here's a rock tune. Here's a little Richard song. Here's this music hall song. Here's, you know, Paul doing some a schmaltzy type of thing. Um, so what, when I'm 64. Helped. Yeah. I mean, the Beatles really did encompass an incredible range of music that um, helped your own musical um, evolution. So they were they were my biggest influence as a child, um, even though lots of other things were in the in in the picture. Yeah. Um, I remember that, the day that Beatles broke up. I was in high school, and I had a friend of mine who came crying. He showed me a newspaper. Yeah, he said Paul Paul busted the Beatles, or Paul's leaving the Beatles. Yeah, the article in the paper, and he mm. was shattered, like oh. the dream was over, the generation's yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. Well. You know, that must have been a, it, I mean, I was so young, you know, probably by the next day, it didn't mean anything to me other than, you know, I wasn't ever going to see the Beatles, you know, but of course it wasn't too long afterwards that, you know, say all things must pass came out. And I can remember having a copy of that, you know, at the age of seven, you know, and listening to, to that music and, and its influence upon me, you know, it was, that was a huge huge influential time period for probably everyone but um as an impressionable young kid it really and i was and i i was an eager musician even though the music and the musicians weren't in our our family we had um everybody loved music and my mother had uh well there's always the, the radio was always on or the record player and my mom was a big soul fan. She loved Ray Charles and uh, 
James Brown, you know, she, Isaac Hayes, she had a lo lots of cool records. So that influence was there. And of course the radio in Detroit in those days, um, CKLW was just, I mean, I've even, friends of mine have sent me playlists of CKLW and it'll be Neil Diamond. And then it'll be like a band like the Flaming Embers, which is a, a Detroit group, uh, even the parliaments, you know, and then of course all the Motown stuff, you know, it was just a wonderful period of music, a wonderful time for music. But coming from Detroit City, come on. You can't have a better address in Detroit City. I'm born in Detroit. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I didn't quite catch you there. Say what you're saying about Detroit. I'm saying about Detroit. You're born in Detroit, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Right. Detroit is like Rock City, like that Kiss song, Detroit City. Totally. It's a big deal. So what oh, I'm yeah. saying is, if yeah. you want to be a master musician and you turn around and go, I'm from Detroit City, you've already made it if you're in well, the US. Well, they, the Detroiters have a um, an attitude and an approach to music that is maybe a little bit different than other towns in America or special in its own way, not maybe different, maybe just maybe slightly more pointed. Um, when... Yeah, the MC5 did the kick out the jams, you know, this whole concept of like kicking out the jams. Like, what does that mean? Well, that means like this better rock, you know, like this had better really rock. And if you cannot kick out the jams, like you are going to get kicked out. We are going to kick your butt you know? <laughs> because it was such a competition between the groups and so all the, the groups that were there, just like any town, you know, be it the Liverpool scene or with, with the Beatles back in those days. I mean, the Beatles were a benchmark or there were other bands that were benchmarks. You know, you had to be this good in order to get the gig. So the same applied in Detroit. And by that time, the music had evolved into a very raucous kind of heavy, um, angry you know, there was a lot of anger, you know, it's almost punk, you know, and, but the musicianship was there as well. You see that all these bands could play rock and roll music from the fifties. They all learned how to play little Richard and, you know, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis songs and who had Buddy Holly, they knew how to play that stuff. It was in their catalog. So then when the superpower came up and, all of a sudden, this band is supporting Cream at the uh, at the Grandy Ballroom. Well, you damn well better be able to kick out the jams because, like, Cream are on next. <laughs> you dig it? It's you know? amazing how, like, you talk about soul and you talk Hitsville and mm. you talk, you know, where it came from. Mm. Gordy, what's his name? The guy that yeah, did Barry. the... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Barry. You associate mm -hmm. him... With that, and then Michael Jackson, the Jacksons. Yeah. And what I'm trying to get to is all these people in different places are associated with music in a different way. Like you said, mm -hmm. like if you say to me the word Detroit City, my mind goes bang, kiss, because of their song, Detroit sure. City. So what well, happens is, look, yeah. this is what happens. It sets people off certain songs, and mm -hmm. they go ballistic for the songs. Of course. I mean, all the bands knew at that time that Detroit was the epicenter of the rock and roll mo movement because that when um, Bob Seger did his live uh, Silver Bullet Band album at Cobo Hall, and he says he's quoted as on record saying, you know, uh, they say the Detroit audiences are the best audiences in the whole world, you know. And he said, I've known that. And he says, shit, I've known that for 10 years, you know, because, of course, he's been doing it for 10 years in Detroit. And uh, so all the bands, including Kiss, you know, when they did their their live, um, the live album, I think it was their fourth album or something like that. You hear the reaction of that on that that audience tape. And those people are into rock and roll because 
you know, it's a five, you know, I've been listening to the, the five o'clock world by the, um, what's the name of that band? Uh, well, it doesn't, the Vogues. And, you know, Detroit is very much like that. It's an industrial town. People are working nine to five. They're living for the weekend to come. And, but the concert might be on a Wednesday. And these people are willing to stay up and not get home until probably one o'clock in the morning to go and see their favorite band at, at say, Cobo, or Cobo Hall, you know, Ted Nugent or, you know, whoever else, you know, some, you know, and this was, there were concerts every day of the week. And that's what people lived for. It's, it's so I've got to ask you something else too, John. This is me. And I know mm. you're a big Beatles fan. So I'll try and give you an idea of what goes through my head. Mm. It's 1964. All right. Mm. You know all the songs from 1964. Sure. You know, A Hard Day's Night. When I heard that on the radio, that first chord, totally mm. different culture musically like what yeah. is from yeah, just yeah. the first chord so yeah, yeah it changes the society and the music and what it is completely it's like a road mm. and and the sound actually makes it that first chord Perfect. is something no one's heard before i'll give yeah. you another example of that for example you go to 1968 right mm. and you've got simon says by the 1910 fruit company yeah, i just heard that right? on the radio the other day now yeah. what happens is I interviewed Frank uh, Jekyll, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, He's yeah. telling me all these fantastic things because that was the song that started, kicked off the bubble gum, even mm. though you go back to when the Monkees released I'm a Believer in 1966 in December. Mm. That's like one of the first early bubble gum sounds, and I'll tell you why. Because Jeff Barry mm. produced that song, even though Neil Diamond wrote it. Yeah. But then in 1969, who's got the biggest number one bubble gum hit? Sugar Sugar, that's been yeah. written by Jeff Barry. Yes. And the other yeah. guy, I've forgotten his name right. Yep. So it was co-written and he produced it. But going mm. back to 1964, I want to I want to put your mind on this mm. plateau. You know all the songs from 1964. And if sure. I tell you, being a songwriter yourself, not only do you listen to songs, but you say to yourself, gee, I wish I wrote that song. It's the most perfect song. And to me, mm. 1964, there's one song by the Beatles. It's mm. not their greatest song. Should have been released as an A-side single, but it wasn't. They did it in their concerts. But, gee, if I wish I could have written one song in my life, in 1964, it's this song. And the only song I can compare to it that's a perfect song, music and lyrics, and mm. from the first note to the end, is by the Hollies, Sorry, Suzanne. Oh, you got like, any yeah, idea? Like that thing as well. Yeah, yeah. I like, you got sorry, any idea what sure. Beatles song I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. In that's a great one. In 64. And All I'll right. give you a clue. Okay. Paul we, sings it. Paul sings it. Uh, let's see. Take your time. It's not a big hit. I'll follow the sun? No, that no. was written beforehand. All My Loving. Well, All My Loving, yeah. Wow, that's a great song. Tell me. In yeah. 1964, wouldn't you have wanted to to write a song oh, sure. like that? How great it is! Yeah, it's yeah. the greatness of the song. It's a, like it's even a, though it wasn't their A side, I recognise the greatness of the song. Oh, even now a, today. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a wonderful song. I mean, I always liked um, "All I Got to Do." That was one of my favourites from from that that era. I liked not that I did not that I. Um, Paul's tunes were great, you know, but I like John's sense of melody a little bit better back in those cool. days. Like, um, uh, you can't do that. I'll get, I'll get you, and things like that. Or, yeah, I'll get you in particular. Um, his his melodies lilted in a very kind of floaty kind of way, even. Um, Ask me why, and that's a little bit earlier. Uh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? It's there's a place. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that, please, please, made sixty three. Yeah, I mean, his sense of melody was quite, quite interesting, um, and and unique. I think that's what actually started to turn made the Beatles this. Besides the every their charismatic their the charisma you know 
a charismatic nature, um, they had a different sense of melody that struck you in a in an odd fashion. And I'm, of course, hearing those songs, particularly the early Beatles songs, several years after, you know, three, four years after, of course. you know, they were recorded. And as I said before, they kind of all hit me as an avalanche. Like, I'm only sleeping. That tune, like, set up a whole mindset inside myself when I first heard it. I was like, I could not believe what I was hearing. And it just, that whole dreaminess of it, just was like, wow. You know, That's like tomorrow knows, never knows. That's like never heard yeah. before. I can yeah. tell you, I am the walrus. This is true. In 1967, mm. I'm in a schoolyard, mm. right? I'm monkeys. Yeah. I'm monkeys crazy. I'm used yeah, yeah. to normal songs. Somebody yeah. plays on the walrus. <laughs> no, but I song. think it's come from Mars. I'm not lying. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. what rubbish is this? It's from yeah, yeah. Mars. Yeah, That's yeah. not a song. No, it's no. true. It's true. I mean, I'm I the walrus. Is it's just like, That's what? what you don't understand. And I, want to, I want to ask you now. Yeah. Because you write songs. Mm. What? Is you got to have a perfect song and a song that you wish you'd have written. Mm -hmm. I'm talking 60s. Tell mm -hmm. me that song. Oh boy. And take your time. I'm not in a rush. Yeah, I'd have to. There are a lot of songs out there that I go this You've got to have one that you associate yourself with that's like a trigger point to writing other mm -hmm. songs because you're basing your songs on something that you've heard. This is yeah. what I'm trying to say is. You may not be aware of this, but these yeah. songs on your path of your growth brought mm. you to where you are, and they've actually are triggers. It's true. Mm. I know I can tell you the trigger songs in my life. The mm. biggest influences for me were Boyce and Hart, who did the early monkey sound, yep. and Mike Nesmith. Yeah, Again, yeah. I'm not talking about the Beatles. They're the greatest. Mm. But for me, I only started understanding music with the monkeys. You can't blame me for that because I'm six years old. In 64, and I don't know what's going sure. on. I'm six, six years old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, Can I can do my sister, it, it's, like, it's Abba. What's the name of that uh, Mike Nesmith song? I, I had no more than I did before, before. but now yeah. I've got all that I need. Where I what's love you and I know Uncle you. Jones, Uncle Papa Jean's Blues. That's it, Papa Jean's Blues. Now, a tune like that, I remember that was a that tune for the monkeys, for me, was like, that is cool. You know, because and when you listen to the chord structures and you listen to the melody that he's developed over the top of that, hey, it's it it's all embedded in, um, you know, Dixieland j jazz. You know, it's it's you know, it's got all these dominant seventh chords, these very interesting structures underneath it that from things that had come fifty years before. You know out of jazz. So when you hear it and it sounds fresh to you or it sounds interesting, um, you know, those sort of things start to click in you. And then when you discover what they are as a musician, you know, technically or um, you know, theoretically what they are in music and you start to mold your own, find them, you know, and find how to use them. Um, then, yeah, there's a lots of stuff that, that makes, has influence upon you. Um, uh, so much. Uh, it's, I think, probably for me, even though the Beatles were played on the radio a lot as a as a little kid. Um, odd songs kind of come into my my experience. Um, even things like, well, the Mamas and the Papas, of course. Yeah, John Phillips is a big influence upon my young ears. Um, things like. Uh, little Anthony and the Imperials, those, um, you know, think I'm going out of my head or something like that, or yeah, Dion right. Warwick, the Baccarat and David songs that were so big. You know, Dion Warwick back was like always on the radio, you know, so you'd hear, do you know the way to San Jose? You know, like every That's day, right. like five times a day, you know, when you're little, you know, in the back seat. What about that other one? Mm -hmm. That other one, the Israelites. Yeah, the Israelites. <laughs> yeah, but Desmond Decker. Yeah. I remember that. That stuck in my the Israelites. Yeah. <laughs> that stuck in my head. Yeah. I didn't ask for it, but they're yeah. popping it out of the radio. That that's all you're seeing. That's yeah. how they brainwashed you. 
Yeah, he that's got right. brainwashed as well. I mean, we we had the forty five of they're coming to take me away, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Napoleon. You know, what is it? The, Bonaparte. And the right. what about the other one? Snoopy and the Red Baron. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, but when you had they're coming to take me away on forty five, you flip. What about it over. hang on Snoopy? Hang on hang Snoopy. On Snoopy. Sure. But check this out. You flipped the 45 of coming to take me away over and played the other side, and it was they're coming to take me away backwards. It was the same song backwards. Wow. <laughs> and <they> played, <laughs> like this. I mean, they know you, you, this is the thing you get away with this sort of stuff back in those days because everything was new and record companies had took gambles. And um, for an ex another example, there's a Johnny Winter's second album, Second Winter. It's a double LP, like so many other people were putting out double LPs, but it's only got three sides. There's one, the fourth side of the, of the double LP is blank. There is nothing on the other side of, of, of the second album. And that's a record company going, wow, there's, enough, there's not enough material for four sides, but we're still gonna put out three. They just don't do that. <laughs> you know, that's faith in an artist, you know. You know, I can uh, tell you, I just want to say, the thing with me is if you love a band, for example, people love the Beach Boys. Mm. They do, because it makes sure. them feel happy. Oh, I love the Beach Boys too, yeah. I know, but what I'm trying to say is different bands do different things to you. I can tell mm. you the fir first album of the Monkees, right? There's a song called Tomorrow's Going to Be Another Day. Have you heard that yeah, song? I know. Yeah, yeah. Right. I've worn the grooves out of that when mm. it came out. That was like, tomorrow's going to be another day. Hey, I'll never stop playing it yeah, until yeah. I walk the record out. Mm. And then what happens is my number one Mike Nismith song is You Just May Be The One. But guess oh, what? Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah, yeah. Over that's time. Yeah. yeah, but listen. Over time, that's my number one song. Number one, number one, number one. Never changed. Then... I'm listening to the second album, More of the Monkeys, the one they put together and didn't tell them they made the album. You know yeah. the story about that album? Or you yeah. don't? No, Do I, you know I don't think I know that. Yeah. All right. So they put out the. I want to tell you the story. Album. What happens is the, the monkeys, the monkeys are ac across the road. They're touring, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody goes across a record shop and goes and finds the album. More of the monkeys, the second one. And they go, what rubbish is this, right? This is their album. And they put it out and didn't even ask us. All they did is get all the cuts from the TV show and put the album out. And the monkeys are furious. Why are they yeah, putting yeah. this rubbish out of us? And it ended up being the biggest selling <laughs> biggest album, album. <laughs> yeah. of all time because that was mm. the right product at the right time, which yeah. they didn't understand because they're fighting about let us play on our songs. We don't want to do this rubbish. Yeah, you yeah. see, it's like yeah, yeah. there's the business side and there's the creative side. Mm. Mm. Right. So the story is they went, somebody bought this album, brought it back, and they were furious. But you know mm. what they were more furious with too? It's a cut and paste job. The album uh, is yeah. pasted and cut together of them wearing suits, their clothes, from a department store called uh, J.C. Penny's. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm happens is the picture Penny's. is actually yep. like cut in half and then put together. Hmm. I mean, get that too. That makes it even worse. You'd be, you'd be furious. Not only have they put that out, but they've gone ahead and put pictures of the clothes. And it, yeah. the tree's not even a tree. It's been cut <laughs> like a tree. And it comes down a line and goes underneath Mike Nesbitt's belt. Has no one ever told you that story? No, no, I had no and idea. Here's, a, here's another fascinating story for you, right? Because this is what I love telling people what they don't know, right? Because I, I just love it. Here's me, right? You know the story of Peter Talk. Okay, they yeah. do the movie Head, then they do yeah. the special 33 and a, a third. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then what happens is Peter Talk leaves the group. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Here in Australia, we don't know nothing. Yeah, you don't know he left the group. Yeah, the no. monkeys are still big, and then sure, they disappear, and I couldn't understand what happened to Peter Talk. And here's the album. Look at this. 
This is the album that came to Australia for sale. And okay. I'm wondering why there's no picture of the monkeys in 1969. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm blank. Where's the monkeys? What sort of an album is this greatest hits? Yeah. Because you know the real album, what it is? The real album was here, never came. That's the real album with Peter there. Ah, yeah, and okay. Peter had, Peter had left the group and they were worried about copyright and that. And obviously the record company said take that off and it didn't. Mm. It got as far from New York to New sure. Zealand and stopped, never came to Australia. Mm. And as I said, we were six months behind the times and the music. Here, mm. you, you, you got the news of the music, what was happening in the States and the US, usually six to seven months behind. We're always behind yeah. in Australia in the 60s. I mean, that's yeah. amazing in itself. Well, it's... Uh, Interesting facts that, you know, yeah. you well, learn things that people don't know. Sure. Well, there's, there's like, just to, just to rap about the Yardbirds, I mean, the Yardbirds were one of the few bands that in, say, 67, 66 yeah. or 67, they did a big Australian tour with uh, Roy Orbison and the Walker Brothers. Uh, I can't remember who else was on the bill, but, you know, and at that time, Jeff Beck... Jeff Beck had left the group, you know, so it was, they were down to a quartet. And by that time, the Yardbirds had kind of slightly turned a little bit more psychedelic, a little bit more slightly punky, you know, yeah. so, so the elements of their hits, like For Your Love and Heart Full of Soul, had become something that uh, had morphed into a far more uh, electric, you know, because you those are produced songs, you know, harpsichords, upright basses. You, know, you can't replicate that on stage, you know. Okay. So, you know, they'd become quite quite a, a more in line with some of the American bands or their competition in Britain, like you know, bands like the Cream and the Who, you know, on on that sort of level. So for them to be playing with Roy Orbison and the Walker brothers, they kind of stuck out like a sore thumb, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like you know, it wasn't their crowd. That's what he's saying. They did the gig, but it really wasn't their groove. Well, yeah. I mean, we often find ourselves in that, you know, if we play like a here in Germany, funnily enough, there's, there's a promoter that used to bring us over quite a lot. Susie, um, Susie Quattro's husband, Reiner Haas, and he used to put on big stadium type of gigs, you know, sports hall type of things. I say stadiums, sports halls. And we would be the token, you know, token um, rock band. You know, all the rest would be like Smokey and, you know, whoever else, you know, some mid, uh, not to, not to, you know, I'm not diminishing them in any any respect, but they they're in, in a more of a middle of the road type of aspect, and it's a bit happy clappy type of environment, you know. And then all of a sudden, the Yardbirds come on, and we're like doing shapes to things, and um, you know, Mister, you're a better man than I, and you know, day, even dazed and confused from the very last days of the Yardbirds, and this audience is just like going, "What on earth is this?" <laughs> It's like, you know, even to this day, they're like going, this is like making our heads spin, you know? Yeah. But you know the best example I can give you of that? The monkey's on tour and they take Jimi Hendrix on. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, what, well, you know, that's another trip. Yeah, and I mean, Jimmy, like, mommy, 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 mommy. <laughs> Please Jimmy take Hendrix is playing and they go, we want Davey, we want Davey. And at the end, he just, he just yeah. had enough. That's, yeah, the a, that's a perfect thing. example of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, so the, you know, and Hendrix, but boy, oh boy, I mean, how brave was Jimi Hendrix, you know? He was a, just a musical giant, you know, and to to cross that barrier of being in a, you know, a Chitlin Circuit type of guitar player from, well, he's from Washington, but playing with the Isleys and playing with Little Richard, um, various other, there's so many pictures of him playing, playing, playing with um, other black artists 
and then to be discovered via the Rolling Stones and then sort of taken off to Britain and then that whole new experience, I kind of know what that's kind of like. It, it was must have been totally different back in 1966 when it happened for him because everything was new and he was just like, uh, people could not fathom how this cat could play. And when they hooked up with Mitch and Noel and started laying down those tracks, they must have known that it was like, we are we are on the edge. We are making music that has just never, ever been crafted before. It's not been possible to craft this music. Now we are crafting it. And to, to be also then accepted into the white rock world to cross over, you know, the way he did. Um, and then, because Jimmy had a hard time, I think, with the whole idea of like, hey, I'm a black guy playing in the white man's world. And he wanted, you could really see it at, at the Monterey gig, that he came back to America, was going to play his ass off to the American public um, to let them know that this is no fluke. You know, I am going to like take the bull by the horns and for those next three, four years that he had, he just changed the course of everything. But John, I'm going to ask you, the guitar style he had and what he played and what he did, mm. it's incomprehensible to me. It's like someone from another planet. It's like, oh. isn't it? You can't yeah. fake that talent. You can't <laughs> fake it. You give us a guitar, he's sleeping with it, whatever he does with his mm. teeth and whatever. He plays it with only a couple of fingers. You mm. can't fake that. This is like no. mind-boggling to me because I'll give you an example. All right. You know the benchmarks. Mm. I'm just saying in the 60s. Right. I'm not saying who's in order, but, I mean, no one comes close to Hendrix. That's that's a fact. Yeah, he, he really was extraordinary. And I think some of his – because he had that – it goes right back, and I often say this to young musicians or younger musicians, that you really have got to know, if you want to play music in the classic rock music in its classic sort of format, you've got to step back and you've got to be able to play certain types of music. You've got to be able to play straight ahead rock and roll. Like, can you play, you know, Rip It Up by Little Richard? Can you play... Um, can you play Georgia on my mind by Ray Charles? You know, these are songs that are standards now for, and there's hundreds of them, you know, and all those guys, Hendrix included, they all knew how to play that music. That's what they grew up on. And that was what was on the radio. And that's what launched and made them move into what they then adapted to or cr then created. So to have that as a, starting place and the sort of melting pot or the the recipe all the different things and then with the new inventions that were going on you know i mean if done it like the fuzz box the first recorded fuzz box was satisfaction with the stones and at least i think um but and the first recorded feedback was actually the Beatles, I feel fine. That was the first time intentionally recorded feedback happened. Um, the Yardbirds, of course, um, had intentional feedback in 66 with uh, Shapes of Things and also um, Indian instruments. The, if, had the Yardbirds actually released the original version of Heart Full of Soul, it would have predated um, Norwegian Wood as the first song with Indian sitar on it. Um, they they scrubbed it or they, they didn't release that version. But Jeff Beck played Indian sitar on the original version of Heart Full of Soul. And they just thought, well, it's a little bit too weedy sounding. And so Jeff played it with the fuzz box. Um, so all these new inventions, the ability to record in different ways, you know, multi-track tape recording. Um, 
loud amplifiers, you know, being able to actually record them, you know, um, you know, recording studios, they didn't like to have, they didn't like their equipment being possibly misused or hurt. So things were kept down quiet and manageable for the microphones. But that one all went out the window with Clapton and John Mayles Blues Breakers. He just said, no, I'm good. This is my sound. You need to try and record it, you know. So he just cranked a Marshall right up to 10 and let it rip. And the guys, you know, were going, how do we do? How do we deal with this? You know, so and they did the best they could. But boy, when you hear, you know, acts as bold as love or you know, the first Hendrix album, man. I mean, he's got Marshall Stacks cranked right up. And that was that's a whole new idea of like that you're going to listen to music like super loud. And of course the Who were in in, in that mix as well. You know. Um, the Yardbirds unfortunately had troubles when it came to um getting that loud sound that the, the notion that the music is being played super loud. Um, and when you hear a loud band and it sort of engulfs you and it's really great, it has to be really great. I mean, if it's rubbish, it's like, well, this is just loud rubbish, you know, and you can't stand it. But if you hear a, a loud band that's totally in sync, and it's, I mean, I mean, it's loud, you know, it's, we're talking over 100 and, you know, 105, 110 decibels. You, there's no getting away from it, you know. It's almost dangerous to your hearing you know, if you're not I careful. Gonna, I was going to ask you about the hearing aspect. Playing concerts all the time, all the time, all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. at that level, you're suffering hearing loss? No, we, we're not as loud as that. I mean, things have become far more manageable now. Um, you know, sound equipment, you know, uh, stage PAs, it, it, it can be loud, you know, and it needs to be a certain amount of loudness or, or volume for it actually to have its impact is kind of what I'm getting at. You know, yeah. these, these records are, you know, when it comes to loud rock music, I mean, it's like, you know, put on who's next and, and not want to just like crank the shit out of it, you know? I mean, because listening to it on two, there's no impact, you know? But you listen to Won't Get Fooled Again at through your system, like blasting, you know, where it's like clean and blasting. You just go, this is incredible. <laughs> you go, this is the way, th this is what they wanted you, how they wanted you to experience this. They want to totally engulf all your senses almost to the point where you have no option but to just be there and be part of the experience and that's uh, hendrix you know be part of the experience here it is man <laughs> it's like you know so and playing loud and playing with power um some people really get into it there's a lot of people who shy away and you know go, oh that's too loud it's, well okay this is not your bag then this is not your kind of music you know, but i mean the beatles must have been really loud in 66 they had the loudest box had come up with an amplifier called the uh oh, super well, beetle wasn't it well they had a they had an amp they actually oh. that actually that actually beat the super beetle it was called okay. the 7120 it was 120 watts of clean power and evidently it's so hi-fi these amps are really rare now they're like they fetch like ten thousand dollars for an amp head um, they only made so many of them but this was the loudest amplifier in the world even beating marshall if they're 100 and the beatles took those on the road to germany uh, when they played in, in Australia, I think they had the AC-100s. But even those, though, they would have been pretty darn loud on stage. So loud that they Ringo would have had a real hard time actually not just hearing them, but like being heard himself. He would have to like really whack the drums in order to 
keep up with those amplifiers. Um, so the Beatles must have been quite an experience as well in their last couple of. They knew what they had to do. <laughs> they had to have the artillery. <laughs> They're going through the house speakers. They're going through the house yeah. PAs. Yeah, there was like Rico's nothing. watching John's feet, so yeah. he knows if he's in time or not. Exactly. And of course, the, the monkeys were doing the exact same thing. You know, it's like they're playing through like baseball stadium, like Altec speakers, you know, horns, you know, like no, no bass response, you know, and a lot. And the only thing that's coming off the stage are probably their Vox Super Beatles, you know, you know, and that's it. That's that's all this. And even that sound can will dissipate, you know, in you have to be very close to it in order for it to actually have the impact, the desired impact. As soon as you step away, you know, 50, 50 yards or whatever like that, it's just kind of like floating around, you know? So, John, I'm just going to ask you, is there any links or anywhere you like people now, fans, to find you? Or is, or is there anything you guys proposing that's coming up or any news you want to tell any, all your fans now? Well, yeah, I mean... So, you know, with this coronavirus, it's been, it's, you know, particularly our stateside um, activity has been put completely on hold. Um, we had a tour earlier in the year, and then soon, as soon as I got back, the virus kind of had taken over the whole world, and we were kind of praying that things would get better, but our, our autumn tour has been scrubbed. You know, the, the big gigs have, have had to pull out. And now it's really just um, waiting on waiting on governments to actually kind of figure out what they're going to do. And I mean, and looking at stateside things, you kind of go, well, they don't really know what they're going to do. There's 12,000 cases in Florida alone yesterday. 12,000 new cases. I mean, I've got lots of friends in Florida and we play all around and, and you start to think about, um, I mean, our audience are not spring chickens anymore. You know, you know people are 60 in their seventies and stuff. And, you know, you start thinking, well, gosh, there's all these people that are passing away. You know, it's like, you know, this is not good. You know, this is really not good. So, um, well, to, to get away from that, um, Certainly, I hope that we'll be back next year doing stuff. And I myself have I've had my second album sort of in the can for almost completed for the last two years. And now it's like with the way the industry is, it's very, very tricky to know kind of what to do because nowadays you don't need a record deal. You don't need, even if you had one, it's like, what's going to happen? You know, it's going to go on to various streaming things and you'll see, you know, uh, nano, nano pennies for every play if you're lucky, <laughs> you know? So you start going, well, how you want to, how do you want to present your music to your, to your people? You know, I won't even call them fans. They're my people. They're my, they're, you know, you can find me on Facebook and I will rap with you and, you know, I don't post a whole hell of a lot, but um, when I got something that I do want to say, um, then I post or something that's nice, you know, then I post. So, but I have, I have johniden.net, www.johniden.net, which hopefully very soon, we so much has changed, even so much as like, uh, We've got to. Uh, I've got to get the um, the website updated so that everything is available and streamable, and that's going to be taking place very soon. So um, as soon as I've got a new new product to do, um, yeah, and you know, there's the yardbirds.com and various different yardbirds pages, my own personal pages. I said, and. Uh, I'm pretty amicable. I like to talk to people. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, the Yardbirds and what you've done, it's all there. And I got to tell you, John, it's been a total pleasure. I've really dug this interview like yeah, you have. We great. got into it and we loved it. And I just want to say yeah. thanks again. So from Plastic EP and I'll let you take us out. 
<laughs> hey, it's been, a, it's been a real gas. It's been a real, real gas there, plastic. Thanks, John. I loved it. I really did. See you, yeah. everyone. Hey, God bless.